Good morning, Good morning and welcome to our in-person and online audiences. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Rebecca Pincus, director of the Wilson Center's Polar Institute. The Wilson Center is the only think tank here in DC with a polar program, which is one of 17 programs that span the globe, covering both regions and cross-cutting topical priority areas. I'd like to thank our co-sponsoring programs, the Global Europe Program, the Canada Institute, and the Environmental Change and Security Program. We are delighted to partner with the Defense Department and the Office of Arctic and Global Resilience on today's deep dive into Defense's new Arctic strategy. Congratulations are in order. The AGR office was stood up less than two years ago, and this formidable new, sta new strategy is a landmark accomplishment. Please join me in welcoming Wilson Center President and CEO, Ambassador Mark Green, to kick off this program. Thank you, Becca, for uh, your kind introduction. Also, thanks for your leadership in all that, uh, that you're doing. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Wilson Center. Everyone, thank you all for coming. And a special thanks to the Department of Defense, Arctic and Global Resilience Office for co-sponsoring today's event. So, uh, a quick word about the Wilson Center and our unique status and history. We were actually established by an act of Congress more than five decades ago, and we've been tasked with delivering nonpartisan, research-driven policy scholarship and recommendations. We fancy ourselves as key advisors to both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue. I often say that that special status brings special obligations. I tell the team all the time, we should not duplicate what others are doing, but instead focus on the most important issues and priorities and do so in ways in which we can add value and, and hopefully make a difference, all of which makes this a perfect place for today's discussion. Uh, as those of you who are joining us here today know, America is an Arctic nation. That's not new. What is new, or at least is finally getting full attention, is that the region is undergoing change on so many different levels. In environmental and climactic terms, projections suggest that the Arctic may experience an ice-free summer as soon as 2030. In geopolitical terms, Russia and China's activities in the region are increasing, as is their collaboration. Encouragingly, Finland and Sweden, two key Arctic powers, have recently joined the NATO alliance. Our key interests really haven't changed, protecting our national security, promoting environmental sustainability, fostering international cooperation, and ensuring respect for the rights of indigenous peoples. What's new are the most recent developments in the region, which now shape how we pursue and protect that core mission. We need a clear and concise approach to the Arctic, and the Defense Department's new Arctic strategy answers that call. It's built around emphasizing the value of engagement with U.S. allies and partners enhancing the department's Arctic capabilities, and ensuring our armed forces can operate effectively in the high latitudes. Today's discussions aim to strengthen international partnerships and help shape a secure and prosperous Arctic future for generations to come. And if I don't say so myself, our Polar Institute is uniquely positioned to foster such dialogue. Founded in 2017 by Dr. Mike Schrega, the first nominee to be U.S. Ambassador at Large to the Arctic Region, the Institute has become a premier forum for, discussing, for discussions and policy analysis of key Arctic issues. You may simply know it as the Arctic Public Square. Since taking over the helm, Dr. Becca Pincus has expanded upon Schrager's work, incorporating her own depth of regional knowledge as well as experience in strategic thinking. Having previously worked as Arctic and, Cli and Climate Strategy Advisor in the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Policy, Becca is no stranger to DOD and lived to tell the tale. Uh, with that, I'd now like to introduce Acting Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, Amanda Dory. Uh, Ms. Dory has a remarkable career in the Department of Defense with more titles than I have time to list. She's overseen a wide range of strategy offices and has true depth of experience. I can think of no one better to introduce the new DOD Arctic strategy here today. She and I had an opportunity to uh, talk beforehand. I can't say we solved the world's problems, 
but we sure scared the heck out of a bunch of them, uh, and maybe that's a step forward. I want to thank her truly and sincerely for taking time out today of her very, very busy schedule to be with us. So thank you very much, and the floor is all yours. Good morning, uh, and thank you, Ambassador Green. I, I think that may be the best introduction I've ever had because the worst ones are when people try to plow through uh, 30 years worth of you know kind of offices and, and titles um, that that I've accumulated in the course of working in the office of Secretary of Defense. So, truly, uh, the brevity is appreciated, and, and the warm words. Thank you, and thank you to Dr. Pincus for hosting this event today um, as an alumna of the Office of the Secretary of Defense as well. We're very proud when we see people who are taking their expertise and applying it in different ways, uh, and I see other former colleagues as well. So this is really wonderful to be here with you today and to help uh, DASD Iris Ferguson and her team with the rollout of the DOD Arctic strategy. So thank you very much for the, the opportunity to say a few words at the front end uh, before we turn to a panel discussion. What I'd like to do is go through a few of the top lines from the strategy with you, why we felt it was necessary to rethink our approach to the region and the ways that we'll go about achieving our desired end state. And I really want to focus on, we had the strategy roll out yesterday by the Deputy Secretary of Defense, and today really kind of already turning to implementation. How, how do we go about implementing our uh, newly issued Arctic strategy? So while the strategy release is exciting, uh, it's really the implementation that is the proof of the pudding, and it takes a lot of players to successfully implement anything. This includes, of course, the joint force, our interagency partners, our allies and partners uh, who are overseas and, and neighbors, and it's really the allies and partners that I'd like to focus on today. As those who are here in the room appreciate, uh, the previous Arctic strategy release was in 2019, and there has been quite a bit of change just over the last five years that I'll touch on briefly. Uh, but even more so in the decade and a half since I had the pleasure of working on one of the department's first Arctic strategies uh, back in the, the 2010 timeframe, again with some uh, alumni from those efforts here today as well. So the strategic environment has changed dramatically since that period. Climate change clearly is rapidly altering the Arctic, which is warming three times faster than the rest of the world melting ice, warmer temperatures, they affect DOD's operating context and lead to increased human activity, including from our competitors. So as an example, the People's Republic of China, or PRC as I'll refer to, seeks increased access and influence in the region and leverages the changing Arctic dynamics to take advantage of Arctic resources and to seek a larger role in regional governance. Then for its part, Russia has continued its expansion and modernization of Arctic military infrastructure. Arctic has long played a significant role in Russia's security approach and economic calculations, and today is no exception. Russia's Arctic military capabilities have the potential to hold the U.S. homeland as well as allied and partner territories at risk. The growing alignment between the PRC and Russia as seen in a 2023 combined naval patrol in the Arctic is of particular concern, and DOD continues to monitor this cooperation very closely. On the other side of the equation, the addition of Finland and Sweden as NATO allies presents an opportunity to deepen collaboration on Arctic security issues and strengthen security and defense and deterrence in the region. So along with the evolution of the Arctic geopolitically, the department is also evolving our approach to the region, and the strategy seeks to update this approach so that it's fit for purpose for this new era in the Arctic. The change in the Arctic's environment increases the risk of strategic competition and miscalculation in the region, which means that it's more important than ever that we have a roadmap to chart our course in the Arctic region. 
the Arctic strategy itself is transparent about the challenges that we face in order to underscore the urgency of addressing them. It provides an action-oriented approach to address these challenges and to realize our strategic end state, which is our guiding light. The formulation of our strategic end state is that the Department of Defense, in cooperation with our allies and partners, seeks to preserve the Arctic as a stable region in which the U.S. homeland remains secure and vital national interests are safeguarded. We spend the bulk of the strategy diving into the ways we intend to get to that end state, and they're organized into three main lines of effort. The first is to enhance domain awareness and capabilities to campaign in the Arctic, campaigning meaning our day-to-day -day operations, activities, and investments. The second is engaging with our allies and partners, and the third is exercising a calibrated presence in the region. I'd like to focus on the second of these three E's, engaging with our allies and partners. While the strategy highlights this as its own line of effort, working with our allies and partners underpins the whole document and is foundational to our approach to the Arctic and, and also well beyond. The Arctic has a unique concentration of like-minded and highly capable allies. Canada, Norway, Denmark, Iceland, and our two newest NATO allies, Finland and Sweden, all bring substantial regional know-how and capability that strengthens our collective efforts to monitor and respond in the Arctic. As we implement the strategy, we'll look for opportunities to strengthen this engagement with allies and partners, and we're working towards that on a day-to-day -day basis. Some particular examples to highlight. For example, the U.S. Marine Corps has long maintained pre-positioned combat equipment in Norway to improve our ability to respond rapidly alongside Arctic allies should deterrence fail. We've also increased rotations of maritime, maritime patrol aircraft to Iceland to improve maritime domain awareness when necessary, and will continue to participate in Icelandic air policing efforts. We recently signed defense cooperative agreements with Sweden, Finland, and Denmark, which provide an enduring framework for close cooperation with Nordic allies and we updated a similar longstanding agreement with Norway to establish more locations to serve as focal points of cooperation in the future. In Europe and North America, we've enhanced our tailored presence through U.S. participation in exercises like Nordic Response in the European Arctic and Arctic Edge in Alaska. Allies and partners are also a source of innovation, and we're working together to develop and field the next generation of Arctic capabilities. First and foremost, we're cooperating with Canada in the context of NORAD modernization. We've also already acquired and are fielding interoperable systems. For example, half of the F-35 program partners are Arctic nations. Additionally, several Arctic allies have also acquired P-8 aircraft, improving our domain awareness in the Arctic. We're building innovative partnerships, such as one with Norway, which is hosting a U.S. payload aboard Norway's Arctic satellite broadband mission, the ASBM satellites, to bring much-needed communications capabilities to our strategic users in the Arctic region. And looking forward, NATO's new regional plans will help guide the development of the capabilities allies need to operate in the Arctic. To help implement the strategy fully, we'll deepen our efforts to convene on Arctic security issues. This will also capitalize on existing efforts. For example, just last month, the policy organization hosted the first in-person Arctic Security Policy Roundtable, or ASPER, if you try to pronounce the acronym, which is a policy complement to existing military security fora, such as the Arctic Chiefs of Defense, the, the CHODs meetings, and longstanding Arctic Security Forces Roundtable. This inaugural in-person ASPER brought together the seven Arctic allies to discuss the evolving threat environment in the Arctic and ways to deepen information sharing and cooperation on capability development. 
all with the goal of improving deterrence and defense. Going forward, we will look to identify opportunities to collaborate more closely on Arctic capabilities research, development, and acquisition. Additionally, we'll explore ways to deepen intelligence and information sharing to maintain a shared threat perception of the Arctic region. Not only are we working with Arctic allies, but also with our robust network of partnerships in the region, including Alaska Native tribes, villages, and communities, and the Alaskan state government and local governments in Alaska. Our interagency partners, especially the U.S. Coast Guard, well represented in the room today, and our industry partners also have important roles to play. DOD's Arctic strategy complements and aligns with guidance in the 2022 National Defense Strategy and the 2022 National Strategy for the Arctic Region, which we're implementing along with interagency partners. We're also working with the Coast Guard and we support the Coast Guard's program to strengthen U.S. icebreaking capability as it enables a key capability to ensure interoperability between the U.S. Coast Guard and U.S. Navy vessels and to support U.S. presence in the Arctic. The recent announcement of U.S., Canada, and Finland to collaborate on icebreaker production is yet another example of the incredible cooperation potential among Arctic allies to drive collective innovation and capabilities. So to close with a reminder of why, are, why we're doing this, this new Arctic strategy is about creating the future that we want to see. One where we work alongside our allies and partners to ensure the Arctic remains stable and secure, where the U.S. homeland remains defended, and our vital national interests are safeguarded today and into the future. So with that as a teaser for the panel discussion to come, let me thank you again, Wilson Center and the Polar Institute in particular for the welcome this morning. Thank you. Thank you again, ma'am. We really appreciate that warm kickoff. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our first two speakers, um, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Arctic and Global Resilience, Ms. Iris Ferguson. Uh, Ms. Ferguson currently serves as the DASD for Defense in Arctic and Global Resilience Office, which was just stood up, as mentioned, a couple of years ago. Um, she serves in this role as the Principal Advisor to the Secretary of Defense and Senior Defense Leadership for Policy Matters Pertaining to Arctic Security and Global Resilience, which includes climate adaptation, mitigation, and energy resilience. Prior to her current appointment, she was a Senior Advisor for Arctic and Climate Security Issues for U.S. Air Force. Um, and in that capacity, she authored and implemented the Air Force's Arctic Strategy. So she has a long history with Arctic Strategies, and we are delighted to have her here today. She will be discussing uh, the new strategy with Wilson Center Senior Vice President and Director of International Security Studies, Robert Litwack, who um, I'm also going to invite to the stage now for a chat. Thank you so much. You too. Thank you, Becca. Good morning to everyone both here at the Wilson Center and those uh, watching online. Um, it's a pleasure to be uh, participating in this event and have this opportunity to discuss the new strategy with D. Ferguson. I guess I'll start with, to me, is an obvious uh, point, which is there are a lot of moving parts in this strategy. So uh, climate, geostrategic competition, economic uh, competition, um, as you had a lead role in the drafting of this. What were the challenges uh, in putting this strategy together? Yeah, no, th thanks. And, and thanks um, sincerely to the Wilson Center for, for hosting this event, for, for bringing us all together. Um, I, I'm, uh, we, we know the Wilson Center very well, and you have all been colloquially called the uh, the Arctic Town Square um, and other fora. So really appreciate you all hosting us to, to roll this strategy out. Um, and thanks for that question, Robert. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, building a strategy uh, within the Department of Defense is uh, not, not an easy task. It's not uh, for the faint of heart by any means. Um, and it's certainly not easy when you're also trying to stay 
stand up the office itself um, that's going to be doing the writing of the strategy. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that has been one of the, the biggest hurdles that we've faced is, you know, actually you know, putting together a startup office whilst, you know, creating new mission space whilst writing at the same time. But, you know, the, really, you know, hats off to my team, quite frankly, who have been the, the lead authors and architects um, of, of the document from, from the jump. And I'm really quite grateful for the, the wealth of thought leadership that we have in, in the office right now. So Im immense gratitude should go to them. I mean, building a strategy, there's a lot of stakeholders involved, and that's especially true for, for the Arctic region. Um, one of the unique parts about having an office that's dedicated to looking at this issue is that we can be an integrator across the department. Uh, and for those that maybe are not familiar with how the department thinks about these issues, you know, as you look at the, the Arctic from the top down, it has multiple overlapping geographic combatant commands. There's NORTHCOM, there's UCOM, there's Indopaycom, there's also SPACECOM, which is a geographic command, um, combatant command, in addition to multiple functional combatant commands. All of those combatant commands have their own requirements uh, that are used to drive prioritization and resourcing. Uh, and so bringing alignment across those is, is, is one of the duties of this office, but also um, a very tricky task. Uh, there's also a lot of stakeholders with our allies and partners. We spent a lot of time as we were drafting this strategy um, and talking to our allies and partners. We went out and visited um, with every ally and partner in advance of, of the document to, to get their buy-in, to understand how they were thinking about the, the environment and the changes to the environment. So that when we wrote the strategy, and we we were discussing the strategic environment changes where we talk about uh, you know, Russia's continued investment in the region despite some of the attrition they've seen in Ukraine, or we, we talk about uh, the PRC increasingly uh, being active in the region with an interest in kind of changing some of the governance structures, or we talked about the increasing alignment between the PRC and Russia, or we talk about climate change as being an undercurrent throughout the region uh, we were very confident that all of our allies and partners were also seeing those things. Mm -hmm. And so it had us, it, what we felt very grounded in, uh, in how we articulated the strategic environment, that it wasn't just a US only perspective, that, that we had heard some of those same um, issues from our allies and partners. And in terms of like structuring a strategy, you also have to think about how you can be concise. You know, do you keep it classified? Do you make it unclassified? We were really intentional uh, from the beginning about making this be an unclassified document so that it, we could tell the story um, to the American public, uh, to, uh, to to our internal DOD community, but also to, to our partners about how we were thinking about the region. And we intentionally kept it as simple as we could. Uh, you talk about the changes to the strategic environment that you've seen since the last strategy, and you talk about what you're trying to do. And you try to you try to keep your end state very clear and simple. We're trying to keep the region stable and secure. We want to work with our allies and partners to do so. Why? To defend our homeland, to protect our national interests. Uh, that's, that's really at the core of the strategy, and we you know, kept the ways and means very simple to three E's, uh, to enhance our domain awareness and our capabilities, to engage with our allies and partners and stakeholders, including their interagency, um, and of course, our indigenous communities in, in the region as well, and then in, how, in exercising calibrated presence. So you're trying to keep it simple and memorable for folks, um, and, and knowing that we can try to hopefully drive some prioritization and resourcing um, in the implementation. Great. Let me just pick up on uh, your reference to Homeland Security, you know, where the Venn diagrams of the strategy all start connecting domestic and, 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 and global. Um, can you flesh out, as you see it, some of the implications of the strategy for Homeland Defense? Yeah, I, mean, I think the, the national defense strategy for folks that know about DOD strategies, that's kind of what we have anchored a lot of our uh, messaging in our strategy around it's the national defense strategy is one of our cornerstone documents, um, and that calls about ho talks about homeland defense as the number one priority. Uh, and as it turns out, the Arctic plays an incredibly important role in homeland defense. Uh, we have an immense amount of uh, of our own defense assets that are that reside in the Arctic region, especially in Alaska. Not only to protect our homeland, but also to project from uh, from Alaska elsewhere. We're going to we're fortunate enough to have uh, the deputy commander of Northcom here with us uh, on the, the next panel, so he, we'll be able to hear a little bit more from Northcom's perspective uh, on on homeland defense interests as well. But you know, I think the strategy really tries to be very clear-eyed about what we have for homeland defense, what we don't have, and what we need uh, in order to better protect our interests in the Arctic region. Um, this is certainly not a new problem set, quite frankly. Uh, this is something that we have addressed in multiple strategies before, uh, but the NORAD has existed for some 65 years to try to address this. But what has changed is the technology has advanced. We're seeing technology um, that our adversaries have, so cruise missiles, hypersonics, these are harder to detect and track. Um, our, our NORAD infrastructure was built 
built for a slightly different problem set. So we're looking at how we can modernize that architecture to have better sensors to include space-based sensors as well. Also, climate change has had a profound impact on the region. Uh, certainly in the last 20 years, we see that with an impact to our infrastructure in the high north. Uh, many of our bases are challenged by permafrost thaw. Coastal erosion is challenging some of our long-range radar sites that we rely on for homeland defense. And maybe what is a, a, not a common reference around climate change that people don't realize, we're doing a lot of R&D on how um, sea ice is impacting some of our technology to include submarine sonar capability and the impact of fresh water on sonars and acoustics. Also, um, how sea ice and the, the actual sound of sea ice breaking can affect acoustic arrays uh, and that you're not necessarily able to sense the same things as you used to because of the sound of the sea ice. These are things that are, you maybe, if you, if you weren't thinking about the environmental piece of this, you wouldn't, it, it, it wouldn't be uh, obvious, but um, we're spending a lot of time working with our R&D community to make sure that we're fully appreciating how the environment changing is also impacting our operating. That's great. I would never have thought about melting sea ice affecting sonar, you know, in, in that way. But um, last question for me before uh, we turn it over to the audience for their uh, comments and questions. Um, uh, let's turn to the geostrategic competition and, and uh, uh, the relationship with Russia and, and a country, China, which we don't, lay people don't think of as an Arctic nation, but is asserting itself in that region as well. Can you talk about that aspect of the uh, strategy? Yeah, I, mean, I think you know, we try again to be really clear-eyed about what we see our, our strategic competitors' intents are in the region. And we see uh, that you know, China has placed the Arctic um, in their strategic documents, is, has been intentional in trying to talk about it, having it be more of a global commons. Um, and we see them investing through their Polar Silk Road economically. Um, we see in Russia the fact that they have continued um, significant investments in the Arctic region, again, despite some of their, their losses in Ukraine, and that is still a you know, very in intentional and strategic priority for them as well. Um, but what's challenging is when you start to look at the alignment of the two of them and where they could potentially hold our interests at risk. Um, I think that's, you know, we want to make sure, we want to be very clear, this document is not about a confrontation. Um, we also are very um, intentional in ensuring that we are upholding international law laws and norms to include freedom of navigation. Um, this, we are highly, um, that is a highly important component of this document to make sure that we are working with our international community to ensure that that's the case. Uh, where we see the challenges between the alignment of, of Russia and PRC is when we when there's potential to hold our own homeland at risk or when their defensive capabilities could become offensive. That's where we start to take notice. Um, and so their growing alignment, um, not only from an e economic sphere where we see China investing in Russia's energy uh, resources, um, allowing it to actually fund a lot of the um, ongoing war in Ukraine, or where we see uh, their increasing military activity off the coast of Alaska or elsewhere, that, that's where we start to have a little bit of eye-opening about the military piece of this. Um, I said this yesterday in, a, in the press conference that we had as well, but I think it's also important to mention that this, despite this alignment, we, we still see it as a little bit superficial at the military level. We still see them practicing uh, with one another um, Well, it's concerning to us. It is, you know, them flying in circles with one another or traveling alongside one another uh, with ships does not make um, an alliance, it does not make them interoperable. We know what it takes to be interoperable with our allies and partners, how long and invested we must be in spending days and weeks and months and years gaining trust with one another, testing capabilities, testing how we communicate with one another, uh, and it's, it does not come overnight by any means, so I don't want to suggest that there are any <laughs> way in that level of cooperation, but again, something that we're, we're keeping a, a watchful eye on. Great. Um, we have about 10 minutes before the panel discussion, uh, so I'd invite questions from the floor. Please raise your hand, just identify yourself, and I believe there's a microphone to circulate around. Um, yes, sir. Uh, hang on one second, microphone coming to you. Thank you, Iris. Hi, I'm Winston Lee with the Wilson Center. And prior to retirement uh, from government uh, for about 15 years, I would hear about new icebreakers for the Arctic, for the Coast Guard. Is there anything the Department of Defense can do to accelerate this process, like funding or other um, activities? Thank you. Yeah, no, th thanks for, for that question, Winston. Um, the 
Coast Guard programs are, are really important uh, for our national security. Uh, we have uh, we talk about it in our strategy how important um, Department of Homeland Security is and and um, our U.S. Coast Guard is for maintaining a lot of presence in the Arctic region for providing um, search and rescue capacity and oil spill response um, and and we really support their acquisition of icebreakers. We talk about it a lot. We talk about it in the strategy. Um, our leadership mm -hmm. is, is very much on record that we are highly aligned and supportive of their acquisition of, of new icebreakers to include three polar security cutters. Uh, I think, you know, we have gone to bat for them in multiple ways in terms of trying to su support that, that initiative. And, you know, I think the latest... Um, the latest uh, agreement between Canada and U.S. and Finland um, is, a, is a great example of the kinds of cooperation that we should be leaning into. Uh, the announcement between our three countries to help collaborate and develop icebreakers together, um, because shipbuilding is hard. It turns out uh, we we also have a, a, a lot of challenges um, that you know I think would, are very uh, well known within our own shipbuilding industry in trying to build uh, with one another uh, and bring together capacity from other nations uh, makes all the sense in the world. So I, I applaud that kind of alignment and really um, we are looking forward to leaning into that kind of cooperation, not only for icebreakers, but but for other capabilities as well. Great. Uh, Sherry, good. hang on one sec. Microphone coming to you. Good. Take Hi, two, Sherry, Sherry Goodman. Goodman. Senior fellow at the Wilson Center, former defense official. I, uh, thank you very much for your leadership, uh, Iris, in this area. It's been spectacular. I am just back from Greenland. Uh, and Iceland, and so I can, and I know you've been there many times, and you helped advise me well before I took this trip, and I can attest to the unbelievable sound that breaking, cracking, calving ice makes, a lot of it, uh, and to the complicated navigation uh, that occurs as more ice is melting out of the Jakobshaven Glacier on the western part of Greenland. It has really complicated local marine operations as there's more ice um, in the harbors now and in the channels. Um, and Greenland itself, as you see, show very well on the map, is of strategic importance uh, in the region and under, um, undergoing profound change, not only climate change, but um, as it melts and it's raising sea levels around the world, but also as it becomes increasingly independent from Denmark and more aligned with other, uh, or available for other Arctic nations to engage in, uh, and non-Arctic nations. So could you share a little bit more about the, th about the thinking on Greenland specifically as a uh, strategic partner? I know we've upped our assets at the former Thule, now Patuffic Air Force Base, but share a little bit more about the thinking strategically on Greenland, if you would. Yeah, and no, I think, you know, Greenland is um, such, and the Kingdom of Denmark and, and Greenland are such incredibly important partners. Um, and, uh, you know, as you just mentioned, Pitafik uh, Space Base um, as, you know, like a, a clear cornerstone of that. And, you know, one of the things that was, when you look at the map um, of the Arctic, is that um, geographically, actually, the Greenland is a part of the North American continent. I don't think folks fully always appreciate that. Um, the irony is that, you know, Greenland is part of the, the UCOM combatant command. And so it's, you know, the partnership between NORTHCOM and UCOM is so critical for us to make sure that we get um, our requirements right for addressing um, not only how we're thinking about threats um, in and around Greenland and our northern Canadian, the northeast part of Canada, but also for the GIUK gap. And so the, the actual territory of Greenland is really critical. At, at Pitafik in particular, um, we've had it, we have a space base that's there, and it's there for space situational awareness, but also for ballistic missile defense warning. Um, it sits at the top of the world, and we're able to see um, threats that are coming at us from the homeland um, from that location. So that's a really critical home homeland defense um, asset as well, and as, as NORTHCOM can, can well attest to, because it feeds into our broader picture of what threats could be coming at us. Um, we um, have long had a relationship with our partners in Greenland, and we really value that partnership. I actually was just meeting with them um, just a couple of months ago uh, when they were visiting along with the Faroese Island and the Kingdom of Denmark um, in, the, uh, in the Pentagon to talk about our mutual alignment and how we're seeing threats 
evolve and change in the region, um, how we can work together with one another, and how we can make sure that you know our presence in Greenland is mutually beneficial for, for everyone. I think we've worked really hard over the last several years to make sure that um, you know our base, um, our space base is, um, is understood and understanding what we're doing there, but that also our, our military presence is giving back in a way uh, to the community. Uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, yes, gentlemen, back. Uh, Jason Reed, Davy Shipbuilding. Um, Iris, could you bring some color to, <clears throat> excuse me, how you see industry's contribution to the, uh, the strategy playing out, please? Yeah, I think you know industry um, is a, is critical for the success of the strategy. I mean, in in all of the 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 three um, E's, but certainly in the en enhancing section, uh, where we we really try to lay out the priorities of of what we need um, going forward. Uh, you know, domain awareness um, is a is a big topic, um, but there's lots of different um, ways to interpret it. You know, I think. Leaning into new technology is going to be critical for us to be successful. We're trying to invest in that now. Uh, we're investing, we just recently made some investments in Archer, which is a ground-based sensor uh, platform uh, for, for NORAD. We've made some investments for NORAD modernization uh, as well. Uh, we've been working really closely with the Space Force and, of course, the commercial space um, industry to advance our communications capabilities in, in the region. Um, there's a, a lot of work happening with the commercial space industry. Um, we're, we've been testing um, over the last several years uh, to be able to give users, of, whether it be our submarines or our Coast Guard Healy ships or, or others traveling uh, in and around the region, access to commercial uh, SATCOM for the first time. And so we've made some real Im incredible advancements because industry is kind of leading the way, if you will, and kind of pushing the envelope. Um, the, that example I gave around the commercial industry is a really is a, is a unique one because I think we the, we as the Department of Defense the Air Force actually ceded some money uh, I think it was like 50 million dollars to SpaceX at, SpaceX at the time to put up a you know couple dozen Pelio satellites in the Arctic that they otherwise wouldn't have done because there isn't necessarily the commercial base for it, but because the military gave that seed money and vested interest at the beginning, it allowed for that architecture to go up, us to kind of capitalize on it. Uh, and now our, you know, it's now that program is part of our commercial sat satellite office, um, SATCOM uh, office. So it's a, a, that's a great example of how we can lean into where industry is kind of pushing the envelope, help seed some money where we think there's opportunity for us um, and then have it be part of a broader architecture that not only we take advantage of but quite frankly the civilian population takes advantage of as well because now that satellite constellation is actually being used by not only military users but also by by civilian users especially those that are in remote communities that have that have not necessarily had access great thanks iris now we're going to segue to the panel discussion with becca join me in thanking iris for Thank you so much, Rob and Iris, for that deep dive. I'm delighted to introduce our next panel. Desdy Ferguson is going to stick around, and we will also be joined by Lieutenant General Tom Carden, who is the Deputy Commander of U.S. Northern Command. As Deputy Commander, Lieutenant General Carden assists the combatant commander in anticipating, preparing for, and responding to threats against North America, and he also oversees NORTHCOM's mission to provide defense support to civil authorities. We're also going to be joined by Major General Ben Mitra, who serves as the Director of Concepts and Strategy for Air Force Futures. He assists with developing and synchronizing U.S. Air Force strategy, global posture, and the alignment of Air Force planning efforts within the DOD. Lastly, we're going to be joined by the Norwegian Defense Attaché, Major General Harold Hagen. Major General Hagen formerly served as Chairman of the NATO Army Armaments Group and as head of the Department for Defense Policy and Long-Term Planning in the Nor Royal Norwegian Ministry of Defense. So we have a panel of experts today who can give us a really good view on what this strategy means for their areas of responsibility, and I'm really looking forward to it. So gentlemen, please come on up. Thank you.
General Cardin, I know you've only been in the seat for 11 weeks, but we're going to start with you anyway. Um, can you tell us what the implications of the new DOD Arctic strategy are for U.S. NORTHCOM and NORAD, and maybe a little bit of a flavor of how NORTHCOM's mission in the Arctic may be evolving? You bet. Well, first of all, thanks to the Wilson Center for having us here today, all of our previously recognized distinguished guests, and that's the first, and congratulations on, on a great strategy. Having been a consumer of DOD strategy for a little over uh, 38 years, I can tell you this, if this is not the best uh, clearly written strategy that I've that I've ever seen is it's got to be in the uh, the top two or three. So congratulations on a on a great job. <clears throat> With respect to to NORAD and, and NORTHCOM, on behalf of General Greg Gio, our our commander, uh, he he's been very clear with us about the national security implications that are outlined uh, in the strategy and NORAD and NORTHCOM's uh, Arctic efforts. You know, we've been designated by the Department of Defense to be the Arctic advocate. So we've got a lot of skin in the game when it comes to the Arctic, and this strategy really helps direct our efforts. We believe uh, that it's going to help uh, with respect to uh, calibrated resource allocation. You know, there, there are not many uh, DOD entities out there that wouldn't benefit from more people, more time, and more money. Uh, but I will tell you, having a strategy come uh, from this level, uh, being as transparent uh, as it is about the threat uh, to North America, I think it's going to help us uh, in those resource discussions. They're going to help frame our standing uh, in those discussions. And by extension, I think it's going to help us work better uh, with our allies and partners with respect to our shared uh, interest in the Arctic. You know, our mission there is certainly evolving, as you've, as you've already noted. Um, we've got to view the Arctic right, through a warfighting preparedness lens. That's, that's what we do. Uh, at, at the end of the day, we know that, that evil never takes a day off, uh, and we can't take a day off either when it comes to making sure that we're taking a clear-eyed look at the threats to us, our allies, and, and partners. And there are some very clear threats to U.S. military capabilities as well as our national interest uh, in the Arctic. Our adversaries are investing in the, in the Arctic. If you've already heard today from some, some serious subject matter experts, uh, they're challenging us. Uh, in the Arctic. They're challenging our norms and they're increasingly collaborating with one another, specifically uh, Russia and the People's Republic of China. You know, the Arctic is perhaps the shortest and least defended threat vector to North America and that's what makes it so important and why I think the timely release of, of this great uh, strategy is going to help us uh, so much at, at NORAD and NORTHCOM. Our competitors continue to develop and deploy uh, highly advanced kinetic and non-kinetic capabilities that could hold our assets at risk and obviously our, by extension our interest at, at risk. Uh, we have to make sure we're prepared for that. If you take a look at the proximity of Alaska to Russia, uh, that takes away so much decision space uh, from our senior leaders in deploying uh, additional capability in that area will obviously build that decision space. It helps us uh, guard against miscalculations so that we can actually detect and identify a threat accurately and respond appropriately in a, in a timely manner. You know, our mission is going to continue to evolve as Russia and China likely will continue to collaborate in the region and that forms great concern for us, but I'll, I will tell you we're many steps closer uh, today than we were two days ago uh, because of this strategy. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, General Mitra, I'm going to ask you a similar question. Can, what does this new strategy mean for the U.S. Air Force? Um, and I'll just, for a little bit of context, note that the most recent Air Force Arctic strategy was released in 2020. Will it be getting a relook? Okay, well, first off, thanks for the opportunity to be here on the occasion of the Department of Defense's rollout of the Arctic strategy and also for being on this panel alongside my joint allied and, and department colleagues. Uh, so the short answer is that for the relook, absolutely. Uh, rewrite, not necessarily. And I don't say the latter just because I'm sitting next to the author of our 2020 strategy. <laughs> uh, but because, as, as Dazzy Ferguson put it in her comments earlier, you know, the, the DOD strategy is both simple, but for us that's compelling when you look at the alignment of respective lines of efforts in the two documents. So for us, for the Air Force, from the, from the uh, national strategy for the Arctic region through the national defense strategy, now these two regionally focused Arctic strategies at the department, uh, 
and service level. Uh, for us in the Air Force, uh, our current strategy has four lines of efforts for vigilance across all domains, power projection of a combat credible force, uh, cooperation with our allies and partners, and ultimately preparation for operations in the Arctic environment. And those resonate clearly with the three lines of effort that are in the uh, DOD's Arctic strategy, almost for one for one that really allow us to build further as a service towards looking to the power projection in particular, because that's where we have a mandate to make sure that we calibrate the resource we accord to this key strategic approach for both homeland defense uh, as well as power projection that we offer as part of the joint force. But thank you for the question. Great. Thank you. Um, General Hagen, to you, we have seen a remarkable deepening of U.S.-Norwegian defense cooperation. Um, just days ago, for anyone who, who didn't note this, the USS Tennessee, an Ohio-class ballistic missile submarine and its accompanying aircraft, completed a visit in Norwegian waters in, in an unprecedented display of close ties between our countries. Um, how do you receive the new DOD Arctic strategy, and what does this mean for U.S.-Norway relations going forward? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Becca, for the question, and thank you for having me on the panel. <clears throat> um, just to your example about deepening the cooperation, you know, we've had bomber task forces, we had the Gerald Ford uh, carrier group visiting Norway last summer, being the biggest event in Norway that year, it seems like, when you look at the amount of spectators that were there. But um, the collaboration just continues to grow and grow. And you know, when we receive a document like this, uh, you know, congratulations, it's, it's a remarkable document. It encompasses the conversations we've had since 2019 about, you know, what the challenges are in the high north and so on and so forth. And of course, seeking an Arctic region that is peaceful, stable, prosperous and cooperative is, an, is, is well in line with my nation's goals, even more important, well, I probably shouldn't put it like that, but in line with the Arctic Council, yeah. uh, that is the, the prominent working body for, for Arctic challenges. So um, when I look at the, the, the strategy as such and the ways being pursued that are enhancing domain awareness, Arctic capabilities, engaging with allies, partners, and key stakeholders, and also exercising tailored presence. This provides for even better opportunities to do what we've been doing quite well so far, but there are still things that need to be done. There is one thing that, you know, in this, in this euphoria that we're kind of like experiencing now, um, the document is also explicit that with the appropriate resources, this strategy will enable DOD to support whole of government efforts to maintain security and stability in the Arctic and beyond. However, bearing in mind the prominent role of the Indo-Pacific region uh, and it, the, the prominent role it has in, in US strategic thinking, the immediate and urgent need to ensure Ukraine wins the war, the challenges in the Middle East and the powers that do not support the rules-based international order that are now coming together uh, in ways they haven't done before, actually um, putting our Western liberal way of life at stake. I think the Arctic will struggle for attention and resources. And being aware of that upfront can help us spur even deeper cooperation with allies and partners. Um, Ms. Dory mentioned the Arctic Satellite Broadband Mission. This is actually a mission uh, where the US DOD, the Norwegian MOD, and Inmarsat came together to provide the capability way cheaper and way faster than any of those entities could have done by themselves. I think there are more opportunities to do that. And Ms. Ferguson mentioned the, the Icebreaker uh, Corporation, which is, you know, in the same line. So I'll, um, I think I'll stop there. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Dusty Ferguson, would you like to uh, follow up on any of these comments? Yeah, no, I, I, uh, well, one, thank you all for being here. Um, I think it's really important for folks to hear perspectives from, from, from the military side, but also from operators um, in, in, in many ways. So I appreciate you all being here. Um, and I think, you know, Harold, to your, to your point, I think it's really, um, it's also clear-eyed, right, uh, to just to be, uh, to acknowledge some of the challenges I think that this region has faced um, around resourcing um, in the past and why we try to be, 
you know, as prescriptive as we can um, in the document about where we think, um, should you have a billion dollars, where would you try to put it first? Um, and how would you try to, like, how would you try to build the, the, the technology that you need for enabling capabilities in particular first? Um, this is why I think it's so important that we have a whole of government approach to this topic, of course, and I, I failed to mention, um, of course, at the, at the outset, is, you know, one of the other guiding lights that we have is our national strategy for the Arctic region that recently came out um, just over a year ago. Uh, that that is, provides our framing for how we're thinking about the Arctic as a whole of government. Uh, there, the first pillar in that is security, uh, which is notable. It's the first time that security has, has been the first pillar of a, a national strategy, uh, and we play a predominant role in the implementation of that. But we're very much in line with, um, the, of course, the White House, but, but the, the whole of government efforts, and we need to be leaning into one another. And we're doing so. I think the, the icebreaker um, program is a really interesting example. Our, our, co our collaboration with NOAA is another really interesting example around weather forecasting and sea ice uh, modeling uh, that you know, our Navy is investing in uh, recently, our work with allies and partners of course, uh, is, is really critical, and I think it, it can save us money, but also benefit the collective. Um, and so we should be looking for creative ways to, to leverage our, our, our individual and collective alignment. Uh, and then I think you, there's also some you know, unique things that we can do that don't cost money, uh, and where we've seen some of that recently um, in Alaska. So for example, we talk about homeland defense um, uh, issues and one of the recent changes within the Alaska Command is that they've changed one of the F-16 squadrons that was originally assigned for training, an aggressor squadron, was changed to an interceptor squadron. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily you know, cost money, but it changes the mission set that helps us get after this. So that F-16 squadron is now specifically tasked to defend our interests in and around Alaska. It's, it's the only, uh, only squadron that has that specific mission. So that those kinds of force structure and realignment that we can do to probably protect our broader interests are also things that we should be looking at. Great, thank you so much. Um, I wanna come back to you, General Cardin. The first line in this new effort uh, the first line of effort in this new strategy is enhancing capabilities, um, and particularly domain awareness and communications are called out. So can you share with us from a NORTHCOM perspective what your top priorities are? Absolutely, and thanks, thanks for the question. It, you know, we're obviously advocating for a wide range of uh, capabilities uh, in the Arctic while acknowledging uh, we can't afford to buy down all our risk at once. Uh, we got to look at those top line risk, and we got to start buying those down uh, one at a time, domain awareness is, is, and communications, obviously chief uh, among our priorities at, at U.S. Uh, NORAD and NORTHCOM. And when we talk about domain awareness, we're talking about from the sea, sea floor to space. We, we literally have to look uh, at every uh, threat vector and make sure that we're essentially, in tactical terms, improving our fighting position uh, every single day because those threat vectors are absolutely challenged on an ongoing basis, and there's plenty of evidence that's already been mentioned this morning. Uh, and then infrastructure to support communications and, and domain awareness, because uh, it's not like those, those sensors uh, can exist uh, in the Arctic uh, without some hardened uh, climate-controlled uh, infrastructure. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time early in my career uh, training for operations in the desert, and we used to have a, a saying that the life's hard in the desert. Well, I'll tell you, life is harder uh, in the Arctic, uh, and, and we're learning that very quickly uh, in, in my new assignment. And then building joint force readiness, making sure that we are trained and equipped to present credible forces if we do have to respond uh, in the Arctic, because it's a monitor and, and respond. And so what do you respond with? You have to respond with combat-capable formations across the joint force, and that's obviously, uh, it takes time, uh, it takes resources, and it takes expertise to build that, and we're very focused on that. Uh, Arctic communications and command and control, again, uh, some of it is, is, is equipping, uh, some of it is training, and then a lot of it is just understanding the environment that we have to operate in in the Arctic, and we're learning more uh, every single day. We need to make sure uh, as already we've, we've hit on it a number of times, uh, our teammates, not only in the interagency, but especially our, our allies and partners, is to make, make sure that we are interoperable in the Arctic so that we're online moving at pace right, in, in the Arctic because collectively we're going to obviously be a lot stronger and many examples have already been mentioned uh, along that line. At the end of the day, at, at, at NORAD and 
in U.S. NORTHCOM, uh, General Guillo talks to us every single day about never being late to need when it comes to protect the North America, and that's what we're getting after our lines of effort. Okay, on. thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, General Mita, you craft strategy for the Air Force. Um, so I want to pick up on something that General Hagen mentioned a little bit. Can you give us sort of a high-level picture of how the Arctic strategy fits into overarching U.S. strategic interests, in particular vis-a-vis -vis the Indo-Pacific and Europe? How, how does the Arctic sort of fit into these priorities? Yeah, no, thanks for bringing up the connection to, to, to these other theaters, as General Hagen did as well. So the Department of the Air Force has long looked at the Arctic as key terrain, if you will, in both the defense of our nation as well as for power projection. It's important to realize that that, that is a very literal two-way street, and also that's geographically really the shortest avenue of approach to both Indo-Pacific and European theaters. I mean, that's, as we live on this great big marble, when you come to gr great circle navigation, the quickest way is over the north. Uh, for both the homeland defense mission as well as power projection for our capabilities within the joint force. So uh, for us in the Air Force, our own strategic alignment also within the national defense strategy, we agree with the department's strategic intent that those activities in the Arctic have to be calibra calibrated to reflect a, a monitor and respond approach underpinned by the robust intelligence activities capabilities, our cooperation with allies, uh, and the DOD's ability to employ the joint force. And for us, that expresses itself in some pretty tangible ways as a service. So to date, we've stationed really the largest number of advanced tactical fighter aircraft, fifth generation, if you will, uh, within the Arctic. Uh, and that's just us. If you add in our allies like Norway that also operates the F-35, that is a compelling, robust presence that we have in the Arctic uh, that also talks to our interoperability going as well. So we have, you know, just within the last four months, uh, the U.S. Air Force has had bilateral uh, engagement talks with our Canadian colleagues in the Canadian Air Force, as well as the Swedish Air Force as a new uh, NATO member. Uh, and for Norway, we've worked a lot with uh, how we operate F-35s in cold weather, where we have a lot to learn from our allies. Uh, in Sweden, we've talked about dispersed operations in the Arctic that they've lived in a re real fashion for over 50 years that, that we can candidly still learn from. Uh, and as well with Canada, we've looked at uh, dispersed power generation and what that means in these remote sites in a, in a cold environment uh, that we can work together on and, and build up to be something more better than that. So that, that's key for us to use as developing a force as a service to use these new technologies to increase our domain awareness and the warning time in what's really one of the harshest environments that we have to be able to operate effectively in going forward. Great. Thank you, and, and thank you for those really illustrative examples. I appreciate that. Um, General Hagen, I have one more question for you before we turn to the audience for their questions and comments. Um, you have a lot of uh, experience at NATO. We just hosted the Washington Summit in Washington, D.C., for anyone who didn't notice the amount of traffic snarls that went on uh, recently. Um, this most recent NATO summit produced a communique that did not mention the Arctic. Um, so can you give us a sense of how deterring Russia in the high north advances and fits into deterring Russia in Europe more broadly? Can you, can you tie those together for us? Mm. <clears throat> well, according to Russian military thinking, the high north and the Baltic Sea uh, constitute a continuous area. With the NATO enlargement, one of Russia's most important goals in the Baltic Sea has been lost, namely to preserve the region as a geographic and political buffer against the alliance. The enlargement reduces Russia's military freedom of action in the region. For NATO, southern and central Norway has become more important for the ability to carry out operations in the Baltic Sea, which also means these areas have become more important to Russia. At the same time, new Russian force disposition could further alter the dynamics. The Kremlin has stated that it will respond to the NATO enlargements and plan to re-establish the Moscow and Leningrad military districts and, districts, and these are obviously well underway. Russia's behavior in the Baltic Sea is somewhat confrontational, uh, and in the Black, as it is in the Black Sea, and clearly aimed at Allied activity. In the High North, Russia's response to Allied operations has mostly been uh, reserved. Though Russia is increasingly distrustful of Allied activity in the North, and this could lead to more belligerent Russian military uh, behavior and more persistent Russian intelligence operations. Um, and as you are well aware, um, what's happening in Ukraine has mostly taken a toll on Russian conventional capabilities. So their strategic capabilities, where they also have invested the most of their monies, are still intact. And many of those resources reside just outside the 
Norwegian and Finnish borders. So um, I think we will need to keep uh, monitor uh, like we've done so far uh, and be aware of any developments that, that, that may come there. Uh, and just to your, your preface to your questions, it, yeah, the Arctic isn't mentioned in, in, uh, in the communique. It isn't even mentioned in the strategic concept. The high north has been mentioned. Uh, but there is a growing recognition of the importance of the Arctic. And as we can see from the military activity that has been ongoing in the high north, uh, it has increased on our side as well. Um, so I think we will we'll see a Russia that needs to balance their efforts uh, balance their attention, and right now their key attention is in Ukraine. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I saved my hardest question for last. Um, we have about 10 or 12 minutes left for questions from the audience. We have microphones on either side. Um, I'm opening the floor. Oh, excellent. Well, I have more questions. Oh, no, I see one up front. Okay. I have, I have an infinity list of questions if the audience <laughs> does not come forward. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Um, thanks to all the speakers. I'm Tom Ellison from the Center for Climate and Security. Um, and I heard it in a few places, um, you know, the idea of exercising a calibrated presence and not looking, f not looking for confrontation or the, the risk of miscalculation or misperception. I'm just wondering if any of the panelists would like to elaborate on um, how that desire to avoid or diffuse miscalculation kind of plays into the design and implementation of this strategy or, or you know, what mechanisms we have available to do that or that we need to, to develop. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I can certainly um, speak to this. And I, I actually would love um, to hear Norway's thinking on this too, because I think you guys live and breathe this every day and how you think about um, about how you, you operate. Um, you know, we, uh, we were really intentional with how we developed the strategy. And I, as I've said before, I think the unclassified nature of it like, lends itself to transparency. I think that's what we're trying to do is be transparent with what we want the region to be. We want it to be stable and secure. And we, want, we care about it because we have our homeland there and we want to protect our national interests. That's our, our guiding light and why we are interested in doing what we're doing. It's to protect our own homeland in many ways. And working alongside partners um, to, to do so. So that in of itself is, is not confrontational. I think we also are, are very clear in how we've structured the, um, the document to be about monitoring and responding. We're monitoring what others are doing. We're monitoring the changes in the environment, and we're going to respond to threats that we see that might that we might need to respond to. So that is, as well, not confrontational. I think it's very common sense, right? We want to see what's coming at us. We want to understand what's coming at us. We want to be able to respond as well should we need to. Um, and I think just the transparency of our ways and means, I think, also lends itself to non-confrontation. It's about building enabling capabilities. It's about understand, getting the capabilities that we need to see to communicate, to have better weather forecasting. I think that is all very common sense um, and, again, non-confrontational. Um, if I may, um, I think it all starts with having the same operating picture. Um, for the past three years, I've been asking colleagues in Buda, where we have our national joint headquarters, how often do you speak with your colleagues in CJOC in Ottawa, with Northcom, uh, with the Danish command in Nuuk? Uh, and of course, we speak lots with Finnish and Swedish colleagues, because, they, because that's what we do. They've been our neighbors for so long. But having that continuous interaction um, in order to arrive at something like a common operating picture. And by using that term, I mean we have the same situational awareness. Um, I think we have a way to go there. Lots of things are already being done. But when we are looking at uh, acquiring new long-range drones, we need to engage more with Canada that just made their decision to acquire the same capability with the US. Uh, that are also operating this and see how our investments can, you know, support the greater good. Um, I also think that in order to capitalize on all the new technologies that are being developed, uh, we need to pursue an open architecture approach. 
so that everyone that develops a capability has, and has something to bring to the table that can make us better has the opportunity to do that without, you know, stumbling into primes and, and, and uh, difficulties. Um, and of course, it's, a, it's about the information sharing. Uh, and information sharing is so easy to say and so difficult to do. But I think we, yeah, I see people laughing around there. But I think we need to take a hard look at uh, what do we really want to achieve and what do we need to do to get there. And then you need to cut some bureaucratic red tape. It's, it's, it's difficult, but we have to do that. Um, and I'm sure you will find ways, Iris. <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? I think I up. Shannon, please. Good afternoon, Shannon Jenkins from the Coast Guard, and I promise I'm not going to talk or ask about icebreakers. <laughs> General Cardin, you talked about uh, that domain awareness and that broad spectrum of threats across that entire domain. The changes to the physical environment, that's one of the things that the Coast Guard, I will say, we don't use the term threat very often, but I would say that's a threat to us in terms of our capabilities and capacities to respond in the Arctic region in particular. I'm curious if NORTHCOM and maybe General Hagen but from the Norwegian perspective, how do you consider those, those threats from that physical environment to what you have to do in the Arctic? You know, what, what we have, have seen, is, again, is just uh, equipping and training the Joint Force to operate there to begin with. And then, you know, in the, in the Coast Guard, you know, in the, and by extension, the, the, the Navy, is just increased maneuverability equals increased access. And everything that you see in this strategy, it, you know, is really the beautifully engineered around raising the cost uh, with respect to an adversary trying to destabilize the region, which gets at, you know gets after our end state. We can this strategy properly executed puts us in a in a position right, to reach our end and to raise the cost for an adversary to come in uh, and try to challenge that. And and so in in every domain uh, and particularly uh, with with our Coast Guard uh, teammates, we couldn't get it done. Uh, in the Arctic with, without the, the U.S. Coast Guard. So hats off uh, to you all for what you do in the Arctic every day and just making sure um, that we are working with the Coast Guard so that we understand all the challenges. I don't know that we completely uh, have wrapped our minds and our technical capabilities around just how difficult it's going to be to execute uh, this strategy in real time. So that's a great question. Any other comments? No, just we uh, uh, would echo the the partnership. I think that's critical for for us to be able to um, to be able to execute not only our strategy but the national strategy for for the Arctic region. Um, the you know the the Healy has been up in the Arctic more and uh, and gives a lot of the lessons learned, quite frankly, for us to take back as we look at our own presence and what's required there. So, really appreciate um, all of the lessons that you guys are bringing back to our own department as well. Great, thank you. Any final questions from the audience before we wrap up here? Okay, with that, I'm going to call it a wrap. Thank you to my- Okay, oh. sorry, can I, can I just, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm just taking prerogative here. Could, could I just ask my team to stand up, the Arctic and Global Resilience team, and in particular, I wanted to give a shout out to Connor McPartland. Um, can you all just stand up, please? I know, no one can see you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Connor was the uh, was the lead author on the strategy, so a much kudos. And Carissa Nietzsche, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, also deserves an immense amount of, of credit for for the work um, that she's doing as well. Um, Chris is actually not here because we're planning um, a, a trip actually just next week for our team to go out to Alaska to visit um, a lot of different Alaska Native communities as we go through implementation um, and do a lot of consultation with our communities out there. So um, again, trying to implement uh, right off the bat, um, there's a lot of stakeholders that we want to be engaged and involved with and just really huge appreciation to the team because um, I'm just a figurehead quite frankly up here uh, for all the work that you guys are doing so thanks well, congratulations Dusty Ferguson and your entire team on this fantastic new strategy thank you all for coming today thank you to the panel that's it Thank you.